2014 Dr. John U. Free Seminar Series is something that we started last year and we plan to keep it uh, going for a long time to come. So, um, see, I have to be careful in this presentation because I have some of my senior design students that are going to grade me in my own presentation since I've been so critical of their presentation skills. So, so I'm going to have to be on my best behavior here. Um, so this is an outline of uh, this year's uh, seminar series. Um, so I start up today, and then we have Dr. Freeze, Dr. Sway, Dr. Williams, and then the rest of it is students, except for this one in the middle here. So we have all of these great fellows here, or students that are going to def defend their thesis before they get out of here. So. We have to be ready to give them a hard time, make sure that they, they're worth uh, graduating. And then this one is, we've been lucky enough this year to have one of the best ma mathematicians in the world come in to speak to us at, at, uh, here at ENC. So it's Dr. Vogan, which is recognized worldly for his work in mathematics, is going to be speaking to us. So that's uh, a great honor. So you should tell all your friends, right? We have to put on a good show for him when he comes in here, okay? That's good for ENC. So today, what I want to do, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to receive enough support from ENC to go present some of my work at one of the most uh, prestigious conferences on my area of expertise, which is uh, atmospheric modeling. And so I did some work last year on the connection between that and uh, seismic uh, prediction. And I submitted the paper and they said, well, some, some more stuff you have to do before we ac accept this paper. So what I'm going to discuss today is what I did in 2012, what I had to do in 2013 to get this paper published. And then as I went to the conference, you know, I was astonished to see that a lot of the people agreed with what I was saying. So when I started this in 2011, so I was just speaking in the dark kind of thing, <laughs> making a lot of uh, wild theory predictions with, based on what I'm seeing. But what I'm going to share with you today is uh, <clears throat> some of the big, very big name in the field that says, yeah, we think that's really what's happening. So that's kind of exciting. So let's start with what, what is this meeting that I say is so interesting. So I was able to see that there was a caption, a caption of um, what happened last year. They haven't put the video for this year yet, but this last year will give you a good idea what's going on in there. the buzz and the energy. Here you have 23,000 scientists from all around the world who are so excited about their science and how it can benefit the world. And they're participating in oral sessions. And if you're not here, you can um, participate through videos on demand. You can go on our website and pick up other content and sessions. We also have outreach to the public here. I mean, it's just the buzz. It's energy and buzz for an entire week. for this year that describes this meeting is inspiring. We had Ira Flato and James Cameron really talking about different ways to inspire people to be interested in science. So I was inspired to try to figure out how we're going to um, capitalize on that, how we're going to entrain them and keep their excitement up. So I'm hoping they're going to get involved in our thriving earth exchange, a way to match seekers of society's most difficult and pressing problems with AGU solvers 
and sponsors and also through our student programs to keep the high school students engaged through through college, graduate school and, and continue in earth and space science as professionals or at least having always had an appreciation um, for science that connects them to their world so they can always remain inspired. So big deal, very, very great honor to be invited in something like that. So, um, so what did I talk about? So let's get back to, if I can find this here. So if you want to talk to someone about your research, that's the place to do it, because uh, for sure they're going to be there. So <clears throat> like I said, uh, we started with that around 2010 mark, and um, so this is a continuation of that work. So here's a, so part of this, what you had to do two things, a 15 minutes presentation and a poster. So this is the poster that's going to give you an idea, so that's an eye. That's an, that's an eye chart, but I'm going to break it down for you, okay? Um, so, what is this stuff? Uh, about 2010, I came up with this idea that there's a relationship between the ionosphere and seismic activity. Seismic activity are what creates earthquakes. What is the ionosphere? The ionosphere is a, is a, is a distribution of charge that's suspended above the Earth's surface, somewhere between 100 to 1,000 kilometers. It's coming from interaction between the sun and earth. That's what that is showing. So if you have waves of sun coming to earth, eventually they free up enough electrons. This electron accumulate somewhere in space, and that's what we call the ionosphere. Now that ionosphere has been used for a lot of great purposes. It's used for UHF, VHF communication, and all that. At the same time, we find that they, when there is seismic activity that's going to take place, this concentration of electron is changing. Okay? At least that's the theory of events. So, so what is the earthquake? Okay? So typically, the, the theory that we have about earthquake is that you have the Earth is made of tectonic plates. So it's a bunch of plates that, shift, that are shifting around very slowly, millimeter per second type of thing. Very, very slow. So you need that kind of shifting around for Earth to breathe. But when they shake too much, which is when earthquake occur, they produce what we call earthquake, and they produce all that devastation. So the idea is to understand what makes them shake more than they're expected. That's one. And second, what is the connection, what is the possible connection between that shaking and charges suspended in the atmosphere, right? So that's kind of a mysterious thing. So, so I'm going to move on all these. So about... Uh, 2010, I was, what, what uh, gave me the motivation for this work, I was watching a YouTube video uh, of a group that came up that seemed to have uh, talked about uh, when rocks are under stress, they free up electrons. They free up free electrons. So I said, huh, if they free up free, free electrons, where do they go? And if it's coming from work under stress, so that could be something that's related to seismic activity because the idea is that when you're going to have seismic activity, you're going to have rock 
that are under stress. And the way they are under stress is three ways. You can see it here. They'll be sliding across each other like that. That's what they call transform, or they're sliding away from each other, the plates, or they're sliding toward each other. All of these create what we, what we feel as earthquakes. So the idea was to be able to create an experiment, to have an experiment where you can replicate in the laboratory, taking a rock, put it under stress to see whether or not you could create charges, free charges. And that's what these guys were doing. They took this slab of granite that you can see here. They attached two metal plates at the end of it. They put it in a huge press, pressed it up, and then they measure whether or not you'll have a flow of current. And that's what they saw. See these curves here? So as you apply stress, current starts flowing up. You get to a certain point where you saturate the rock, so it flattens out, and then at the end it goes down. Okay? So that same saturation that you guys were learning in uh, semiconductor physics this morning, right? And that's the same thing that happens. So you create this flow of charges here as a, a diffusion process. So at the same time, the reason I was thinking about this problem because in Haiti, there was an earthquake that took place on January 12, 2010. And this color chart here shows you the, the magnitude of the earthquake per color. So the earthquake was most severe right here, which was a place about um, 20 kilometers off the capital, north of the capital. And so in about um, an hour and a half, 200,000 people died, right? It's a very tragic situation. So the idea was whether or not if you could create a pre pre predictive mechanism where we could have seen these type of charges that's coming from the stress of, on the rock that's pr producing this earthquake. So the first thing I tried to do is there was a satellite that was put up by the French called Demeter, D-E-M-E-T-E-R. And this satellite that you can barely see here was basically orbiting region where there were, f there were faults. And they were trying to measure whether or not there were electrons ac actually out there in, in regions where there were faults so around the world. And to my surprise, as I went back and started working with these guys and reviewed the data, what I saw is that they had about three years of data on Haiti two years before the earthquake and one year after. So I said, hmm, maybe it's be a good thing to look at that data to see if we can see that correlation. So I started looking at this data, and what I did is I, I went three months before the earthquake, two months before, one month before, the month of, and tried to look at the data that's measured by the satellite as opposed to what would be predicted by a model. For example, we have lots of models that predict this distribution here. They predict very accurately what, how much electrons will be up there where, at what time. Very good job of that. So they could be off from time to time for, from an average behavior. But in general, they'll tell you what the average behavior is going to do very well. Okay? So a model like that, since it's predicting, predicting average behavior, you wouldn't expect for it to catch what's happening in an earthquake because it, it would deviate from the average behavior. So if you put that model on the background of actual measurement, what you expect to see is that this model is describing the average, and then whatever is left that's coming from the earthquake, you should see it pop out. Okay? So these here are over a month period. The blue curves are the average measured by the satellite over a month period, 30 days. All these curves together form a month of data. And then the red curve is the prediction by the model. Okay, so I'm going to say that again. The blue curve is data that the satellite took going around Haiti over, over three months before. So you take all that data, plot it on top of each other, and you end up with this. So you can see a general trend here. And then, then you take the predictive model, you run it for the same, for the same uh, dates along the same trajectory that the, that the satellite went over, try to see what the model would predict. And those are the red curves. And Haiti is in this green little place here, OK? So I put a bullseye here so that we can see whether or not what's happening right over Haiti. So if you look at this, you see the model tend to predict this peak here. It's saying, well, there's something happening here. 
and also try to predict something back there, but never, try, never catch anything over here where Haiti is. That was three months before the earthquake. Here's two months before, same thing. Model is saying there's something here, doesn't predict it directly, but it's saying there's something going on here, and there's something going on here, nothing over here. Two months before, that's the first, well, sorry, one month before, that's the first time you see something, okay? The model is predicting nothing here, and there's this little peak that's sticking right over Haiti. And the month of the earthquake, that's when we see the largest, okay? So the month of the earthquake, that's when you see this peak popping right out, right over Haiti. And one month after, it's gone again. It's back to this behavior. So when I presented this paper, when I sub submitted this paper, the first criticism that came in is said, well, what about if this is a seasonal trend? What about if this thing does the same thing every year? So you should go back, do it the year before, and see whether or not you're going to see something that confirmed this behavior. So that, that was the rest of the work. So I went and did one year before, two months, uh, three months before, two months before, one month before, and to my surprise, two things happened. Now the model is over predicting and the actual data is way down. So, so the data is way down, the model is over predicting a little bit, and the data is way down. So there's actually less charges up there one year before, which confirms this, these two behaviors here. So the idea is, okay, that sounds good, Dr. Cordelie, but why is this happening? Okay? And that's what I couldn't explain. So I gave this presentation a few times and had some very good questions from people saying, okay, where are these charges coming from? Right? So when I went to the... Um, so anyway, so, so let, let me summarize the, the work that I did here. So what we see is two months before an earthquake, we can see significant increase in positive charges being released from the Earth. Okay? And what I've come to see now is the cost of this, this increase can be justified, and justified by these two guys, which I'm going to talk about their work now. So one of the things that happened is when I was presenting the first guy that, that came in to, to me and said, you know, we've been looking for you, we saw this work, and we said we want to talk to you because we want to put some instrument in Haiti, and came and talked to me about that, and they had, at the time, an entire group of about maybe 15 or 20 universities of people working on that, on various aspects, presenting together, except that I didn't know that because I would have been in that group and I would, I would have presented with them. I had to leave on Wednesday when they were presenting. So, but since then, I've been working with them, and the, the hope is uh, to start putting some instrument in Haiti. So let me show you what their work say. So that was the first time I was introduced to this guy. Uh, this is Friedman Fund. He's, from, he's working out of uh, San Jose State University, the Carl Sagan Center, and NASA. So he's a guy that's everywhere, a very big name in this, in this field. So he gave that presentation. That's the stuff that I saw at the YouTube uh, like three years ago. And so I try to summarize the work that he did. And the way to look at the work that he did, you take this granite, okay, you take this granite and you apply a press to it. And as you press on this granite, you start seeing these charges showing up. They are of the same polarity, so they will naturally repulse each other. So they'll end up here. And when they end up here, what's happening is what's going to make them travel is what we call the Earth's global electric field. So that was one of the first things I learned, right? I, learned, I knew that it was going to be line of charges, line of field that these, still, these things can use to travel. I didn't understand where this line of field would come from. So this line of field actually, I'm going to show you, come from what we call the global electric field. So you create the global electric field and you start seeing this travel. So here's the first paper that was presented by Friedman about that. So these guys are doing some controversial talk about uh, um, um, polarity of the, of the Earth that I'm not going to discuss, this first two. What I'm interested about is this. So what they show in their paper, in their presentation, is that here's the hypocenter of, of an earthquake. And when the earthquake takes place, what it does, it does the same accumulation of charges that I just showed you. Uh, now remember, I was showing this stuff three years ago, right? So I didn't have any idea about this, this work, okay? 
what I was showing, this cartoon that I was showing here, if you have been in any of my presentation, I've presented it three times already, right? So what's different now is that a bunch of other people are saying the same thing. So that's what's different. So here is the Earth here, the hypocenter of, of an earthquake. And as you start having this stress within the rock, and you see this charge coming up here, and eventually this charge travels through this field. That's the global field. So there's, what these guys were able to show is between the Earth's surface and the bottom of the ionosphere, there's a global field that exists. And these charges can easily use that global field to travel up. So we've solved that problem, right? We know how, how these charges get up there, because that was a, a big question. Okay? The second thing that they show, which is even more significant, is how do these charges, how are they created from, from the stress? Okay, so that's another paper that they publish, and I'm going to show you some of the things they're showing here. Again, is some of the things I've been talking about three years ago. So the first thing is they take a, a metal plate, and they pressure the metal plate in the middle. So that's a metal plate here, thin, thin metal plate, and they pressure it in the middle. And as they pressure it, they put an instrument here to see whether or not they're going to be able to measure charges. And sure enough, look at this. Here are these charges that jump to the edge of the plate, right here. Okay? So these charges actually create current distribution. And so, before I back up, so how are these charges created? So, what they looked at is they were able to go back and look at behavior of crystals. So, in general, crystals, what you have is what they call pyroxy defect. Basically, the oxygen. Um, uh, covalent bond with covalent bond. So here, here you start with these double oxygens here. They are in a dormant state when there's no stress. And then as you start applying stress, they become transient. Oh, sorry. Oops. Uh, back four. They become transient and they look like this. So you see the, the O with a little dot next to it? So now these stable atom of oxygens all of a sudden becomes transient and they're able to combine. And so what happens? The minute they become transient form and willing to accept an electron, an electron jumps in. And the electron, when it jumps in, what does it do? A hole is freed. That's where these charges are coming from. So the positive charges are coming from the fact that pyroxy defects within a crystal, within the rocks, can become unstable under stress. And when they become unstable under stress, they can accept an electron. And when they accept an electron, a hole becomes free. Does it make any sense? Yeah. You guys should be up to that. You've had all this this morning, right? <laughs> so of, over time, this is what we're measuring. And here's the behavior. Like if you press on the rock, as the stress starts getting higher, you have more of this electron dropping in, and more holes becoming free, and this starts going up. When the, when the rock gets saturated by the stress, then it flattens out, and eventually it goes down. That's the behavior. This is actual measurements of things that's happening in the field. So second problem, we've solved two problems now. First problem is, when we have positive charges being accelerated to the surface of the rock, we know how they get up to the higher heights, to the global electric field. And second, we know where these positive charges are coming from. They're coming from pyroxy defect within the crystal. That's where they're coming from. Two big problems. So, so here's a summary of his work. This is huge. This work here is huge, I think. It answers a lot of questions for me. You know, where as to when somebody asks me these things, I don't have to say, ah, uh, you know, ah, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I can say definitively that a pyroxy defect that starts like this, but in presence of stress become unstable, and then the O2s combine to give off an electron, which then create a hole. And that's what we get. And these holes are uh, what travel up there and create disturbance in the ionosphere. And that's what we can measure. So the idea is, how long before an earthquake occurs, does this happen? 
Okay, so that's another thing. So that's going to be considerable. Is that a week? Is that a month? Even if we could say anything a week before, I think we can make a lot of changes in the way earthquakes are being perceived around the world right now. So the next thing that was done is by the other, Tom Blair. He actually went and created a set of instruments that can measure the magnetic field that's coming from these positive charges that are being freed. And what, so he went, simulated a set of equations, diffusion equation, does that make sense to you guys? Diffusion equations of when the holes start moving, how well are they diffusing across the global electric field, okay? Diffusion mean the, uh, the gradient, the variation of number of charges as a function of space and time. That's what that is. And so he simulated a set of equation, which is here, which I'm not gonna talk too much about, diffusion equation, and then that's what shows up. But guess what? You can see that when you start uh, applying the stress, all of a sudden the magnetic field increases, and then you get to saturation, it, it levels off, and then all of a sudden it goes down again. That is the same behavior we saw from the current pattern, right? If you, if you, if you create a current in a, in a wire, and you go away from the wire, guess what? You're gonna measure magnetic field away from that wire. So these two are exactly co correlated, and they have exactly the same behavior. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what they did. They went in a circular pattern around the stress area, and they were able to show this white circle here is a measure of the uh, number of charges that they could see there. So that's the second big thing that shows not only we can see this from the point of view of the charges, we can also see it from the point of view of the magnetic field that's created by these charges. And so that's the guy that I'm trying to work with. He's developed a set of instruments, and I'm going to show you a, a cartoon of that, where you can actually place the instrument and measure this behavior. Okay? I think we've... Uh, so he's gone and started putting this all around the world, and now I'm trying to convince him to go over here and put some, right? So the idea was that we could go and do a, uh, a survey kind of thing, get some money from... NSF to do a survey, go see where to put them, and then have a grant submitted where you can actually put some instruments out over there. But let me show you something he's given us as to how this works. I'll do the no word first, and then I'll say something after. That make sense? Let's try it again. So what you're gonna see <laughs> So first you start seeing that's the observation point and that's the instrument over here and that's the epicenter of the earthquake. You start seeing the first sign of pulses going out. Okay? And so it takes some time, so you get that, those are, that this would be an early warning. So after a while, these pulses are going to intensify. And as they intensify, what you're going to start seeing is both they can measure the charge distribution that's being created. And I don't know why this is doing this. And <laughs> maybe there's an earthquake here or something. <laughs> and the magnetic field. And that's what it's measuring. And then at the end, you're going to see that the actual fracture doesn't happen until maybe five, ten minutes later. Okay? So, uh-oh. Well, you guys get the idea, right? <laughs> so we're getting more fun than we're looking for here. 
So, so anyway, these guys were able to actually use actual simulation of the instrument to show how this thing is done. So the hope would be to put some of these in the uh, southern or northern fault of, of along the northern or southern fault lines of Haiti and start taking some measurement. So here's my two good friends now. This is uh, Friedman Fund and this is Tom Lyre. And they did this work again with a big slab of granite and that they are leaning against here before. They fracture it and then they put it under stress here and show you what happened after it breaks and this is what they were able to measure. So, you know, they've done this stuff over and over in different situations and show that this thing works, okay? It works very well. And now they went on the field. That's one of the instruments they have in Peru. And they did the same thing for, that's an actual earthquake in Peru where they were able to measure these pulses here. Okay, so this is real data. So that th this is what they're measuring here is the number of pulses they're seeing as a function of time that's emerging in various areas. Okay. okay, so I think uh, right now we, you know, I feel confident that th this is a good paper that we just put out, being recognized. As a matter of fact, I was interviewed um, by AGU. Let me see if it's here, and that was pretty good. This lady came in, was kind of uh, fascinated with the work. And she had me tons, asked me tons of questions, and I didn't realize until she left. I didn't ask her who she is and what she's going to do with that information. <laughs> so, of course, I tracked her down for an entire day, and then I was able to find her. And she says, yeah, I, I published an article on your work. And so it is. So it is. So we have an article published by AGU as a function of that. So she recounted whatever I told her at the time, so kind of interesting. So where, where do we go from here? All right, so, so now we're writing a, a bigger paper that's going to include that work. Some of the holes I had in my work was because I didn't understand the previous work. So now that I understand that, I can, we can write a much bigger paper that put all that I just discussed here within the context of the work. I was... Uh, uh, approached by you Northeastern know, to come and give a presentation. I don't want to give it until I put that paper together and I can present that paper. And then I'm going to use that opportunity to see if I can set up collaborative work with them, see if I can work with the math department at Northeastern. So starting to work with these two guys, particularly with Friedman, because he doesn't have any background in what I'm doing. I don't have any background in what he's doing. So we can certainly work together to advance the field and Tom is the one that's developing this instrument. So what we want to do is put some instrument over in Haiti and have access to some of the data that he has right now. For example, I sent, I sent him an email last week and he was in Peru, uh, not Peru, is that Peru? He was somewhere putting some stuff, so. So, and then where do we go from this work? So this, this satellite that we use, that data is out of orbit, not there anymore, nothing you can do with that. So the to go forward, what we're going to do is use data from GPS. So GPS data can give you the same type of information. If you treat them correctly, they can give you number of electrons along the line of path, and you can use that to do the same kind of work. As a matter of fact, one of our students, um, Joe Armstrong, did his senior work in that area and probably will present that at um, the academic symposium. He did some pretty impressive work in there over, over Japan. Real data showed how you could show what happened around the earthquake time in Japan using that type of data. So that's, that's where to go. So it's two sets of instruments that probably you want to deal with what these guys, uh, Tom and his group, group are creating, and then GPS data could give you the, uh, the number of electrons. So that's Next big work that I try to do is there. We've, we're starting to work already with some folks to take data from instrument in Japan and automatically convert that into a number of electrons and be able to look at that and analyze it. So that's going to be the big new area of research starting probably the end of this year. Start working on that. I mean, the end of this semester, I mean, not this year. <laughs> the end of the semester. 
all right, so I want to thank all of these folks. You know, this is the person I've been working with that helped a lot in being able to take, uh, to do the model, the background model. So he's the guy that developed this model, very, very competent. And these are the people that gave us the data. These are Fun and Blair from that I developed relationship with after coming out of VGU. Of course, Dr. Free. And Michael O'Brien that did some previous work in this, still trying to publish this in Young, young Journal of Investigators. What do they call it again? Young Journal of Investigators. They're pretty tough, right? But he's going to publish it because they, they, he's in revision right now. So still trying to make sure he published that work that he did as a result of his own design, senior design presentation. So, all right, so that's my story and I'm sticking to it and I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> So keep coming back, particularly when these guys are presenting so that you can give them a tough time, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>